Welcome to Worship with St. John United Church of Christ. Today we celebrate the third Sunday of Advent, lighting the candle of love. I hope you've had a chance to take a look at our Advent prayer wall that's going up a bit each week. And I hope that you're also taking a chance to go to our Facebook page, to our Instagram account, or to our Twitter account and tell a story of hope, a story of peace, or a story of love. This week, we are asking the questions, how have you experienced God's love? How have you experienced love of neighbor, especially in this last 12 months? And how have you sought to love your neighbor as yourself? When you get to our page, make sure you add the hashtag stories of hope so that others can also find these online. I'm going to take some of these stories and put them together into a reading of the week of Christmas. So um, you can wait and see those. Carolyn Harding has an announcement for us about an event this week. Hello everyone. I just wanted to let you know about an event that we're going to have on Tuesday, December 15th from 7 p.m. to 8.30 p.m. Cindy Berkner and I will be telling stories of Advent that evening via Zoom. So we'd really like you to curl up by your tree, get your favorite cup of hot cocoa or whatever it is you'd like to drink while you're listening, and join us that evening for some really great stories. Currently it is out on our Facebook, so if you are on the Facebook, the link will be there. If you don't have Facebook and you would like to find out the link, please contact Cindy Berkner and I at any time, or you could even call the church office to get the link. We sure hope to see you then. Thanks. So one of our Christmas Eve services is going to be an outside service at nine o'clock on Christmas Eve. And I'm actually getting kind of excited about this. It, it, I think it'll be interesting, really excited about the music and the readings we've selected for this. We are going to gather between our buildings. Uh, figured there's less wind there and we will be lighting candles throughout the service. So as you know, um, normally we give you little candles like this on Christmas Eve. Uh, we've actually found a bunch of these cups and so we have these candles in these cups um, which should last a little bit longer and it'll protect it somewhat from the wind. However, if you are interested, these cups will actually hold a, a candle that is up to seven eighths inches in diameter, much bigger than this little thing. So you can bring that along, it gives you a bigger candle to hold. If you have any candles in jars, bring one of those. That's a really good thing to hold and will really be protected from the wind. And then we will also have available these lovely uh, things. These are our electric candles. Promise you it will not go out in the wind, but it, it loses some of the magic uh, that you get from a real, a real flame. But in any case, you have options. Uh, so hope to see you there for that service. And we'll tell you more details next week. For Christmas Eve here in the sanctuary, you have two options. One will be Sunday, December 20th at 9 a.m. We are actually going to use that time slot to record the Christmas Eve service that we'll put up online. We will have Christmas Eve in the sanctuary at 7 p.m. on Christmas Eve. And we will also have that, um, I'm not sure if it's gonna be live broadcast or if that's gonna be the video of the, the Sunday service. Uh, so hope to see you there for that. Other things that we're doing will be online and you should have gotten a card explaining all of those to you. There's a lot going on that week of Christmas. Finally, um, I have a sad announcement, uh, a couple of sad announcements. We lost this past week, Jim Kreider and asked that you keep his son, Steve Kreider and daughter, Lisa Brown and their families in your prayer. Melanie Stolliver's father, John Thousand, passed away this past week, so keep Melanie and her family in your prayers as well. 
And then I learned Saturday morning that Reverend Harv Creamy passed away. So please keep Jackie and her girls in your prayers and we'll forward more information on as we know more. We are living through difficult times. It's a Christmas like no other. And yet we celebrate the coming of the Christ child in our midst, remembering that Jesus did not come to a world that was perfect, but to a world that was hurting and aching. And as we prepare for his coming this Christmas, these stories that we tell give us new insights, new meaning to this old, old story. Let us worship God. At this point, I'd like to invite the McCryakow family to come up. Stephanie with her children, Crystal and Toby, are going to light the Advent wreath today. We gather around the Advent wreath today, and we remember that Christmas is a time of worship, the moment when the busy of us pause to wonder. Christmas happens when God comes to us in love through Jesus Christ, and fills us with love for all humankind. God's love was revealed among us in this way. God sent God's only Son into the world so that we might live through him. In this is love, not that we love God, but that God loved us and sent Jesus to be the atoning sacrifice for our sins. Beloved, since God loved us so much, we also ought to love one another. 
We light this candle to proclaim the coming of the light of God and the world. With the coming of this light, there is love. Such great love helps us love God and love one another. Let us pray. O oh God, we thank you that Jesus showed your love for every person. Babies and children, old people and folks in the middle, sick people and those who were strong, rich people and those who were poor, people who were accepted and those who were outcasts. Come to us in this Advent season and give us love in our hearts for all people. Amen. Joy is a song that welcomes the dawn. Jesus has come. shall be first and the weak shall be strong and none shall be afraid. I have traveled many the babe inside and I wonder what I've done Holy Father you have come and chosen me now to carry your son I am waiting in a silent prayer. I'm frightened by the load I bear in a world as cold as stone. Must I walk? Breath of heaven. 
in my darkness, pour over me your holiness, for you are holy. Breath of heaven, hold me together, be forever near me, breath of heaven. Breath of heaven, light in my darkness, pour over me your holiness, for you are holy. Breath of heaven, breath of heaven, breath of heaven. Let God's people say amen. Our scripture is Isaiah chapter 61, verses 1 through 4 and 8 through 11. Last week we talked about comfort, comfort ye my people. And that which starts at chapter 40 is the second part of Isaiah, possibly, probably a different author. And then when you get to this section, these last few chapters are a third section that come at a different time. And these are more instruction for the community of how they're supposed to live going forward. At this point in Israel's history, the nation is divided and the leaders aren't really providing very good direction. It seems that the religious leaders in the temple were more interested in, in a purity of, of race, a purity of people, and had forgotten to look out for the oppressed, for the outsider. And so that's where these words come from. They are, among other things, the first words that Jesus spoke in his public ministry when he went into the temple and unrolled the scroll and read them there in Nazareth. The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me because the Lord has anointed me. He has sent me to bring good news to the oppressed, to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and release to the prisoners, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor and the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all who mourn, to provide for those who mourn in Zion and give them a garland instead of ashes, the oil of gladness instead of mourning, the mantle of praise instead of a faint spirit. They will be called oaks of righteousness, the planting of the Lord to display his glory. They shall build up the ancient ruins. They shall raise up the former devastations. They shall repair the ruined cities, the devastations of many generations. Strangers shall stand and feed your flocks. Foreigners shall till your land and dress your vines. But you shall be called priests of the Lord. You shall be named ministers of our God. You shall enjoy the wealth of the nations, and in their riches you shall glory. For I, the Lord, love justice. I hate robbery and wrongdoing. I will faithfully give them their recompense, and I will make an everlasting covenant with them. Their descendants shall be known among the nations, and their offspring among the peoples. 
All who see them shall acknowledge that they are a people whom the Lord has blessed. And our second reading comes from the Gospel of John. There are different theories about who each of the gospel writers were, and John is hard to place because there were a lot of Johns mentioned in the Bible. What seems clear is that this was written to a community of people that maybe believed a little bit more in John the Baptist than some others. In this gospel, there is an attempt to convince people that John was merely there to point toward Jesus, which would be an important thing to convince people if many of them really liked and respected John. So hear these words and how the gospel of John speaks of the baptizer. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. He came as a witness to testify to the light so that all might believe through him. He himself was not the light, but he came to testify to the light. This is the testimony given by John when the Jews sent priests and Levites from Jerusalem to ask him, who are you? He confessed and did not deny it, but confessed, I am not the Messiah. And they asked him, what then? Are you Elijah? He said, I am not. Are you the prophet? He answered, no. Then they said to him, who are you? Let us have an answer for those who sent us. What do you say about yourself? And he said, I am the voice of one crying out in the wilderness. Make straight the way of the Lord, as the prophet Isaiah said. Now they had been sent from the Pharisees, and they asked him, Why then are you baptizing, if you are neither the Messiah, nor Elijah, nor the prophet? John answered them, I baptize with water. Among you stands one whom you do not know, the one who is coming after me. I am not worthy to untie the thong of his sandal. This took place in Bethany, across the Jordan, where John was baptizing. Here ends the reading of God's holy word. Know that it is true and can be trusted. Amen. The other day, while I was working in the office, Steve Grody called. He'd been here in the building just a moment ago, um, but he, I guess, had run out to Lowe's to do an errand, and he had a question. And while he was talking to me, he says, all the Christmas lights are gone. The shelves are empty. There are no more lights. I was kind of surprised and a little disappointed. I had hoped to get over there at some point and get a few more lights for our house, but no worries. I, this could be a supply chain glitch. Christmas lights could be the new toilet paper. Um, but I'm guessing that the reason there are no lights on the shelves are because people are just putting up more lights this year. Not really able to go and do the things we normally do, so we might as well make our light, our house and our, our tree bright and shiny. And I think that's probably true. I have a neighbor a block away from us, and their house always looks like Clark Griswold's, you know, Chevy Chase's character on National Lampoon's Christmas Vacation. I mean, it's lit. It's very pretty. It's white and red lights, and they do it every year. I walked past with the dog the other day, 
after the lights turned on and I realized that they had decorated their backyard. Who decorates their backyard? But this year, I guess you do. We want to have more lights. We, we want to have more signs of Christmas. And for Christians, anyways, this image of light is not just about making your house look pretty. We have this metaphor of Christ being the light coming into the world. I'm not convinced that everybody who puts strings of lights up on the house are doing it to welcome Christ. But for us, as we do this sort of thing, that's got to at least make a, a piece of our thinking. And the Gospel of John's portrayal of the Baptist emphasizes this. John is witnessing to the light. He's testifying to the light. He's like this great mirror and any light that, that you know, comes towards his way, he reflects it back out. Jesus is really the true light. He, he doesn't want to take any of the credit. But he is one who reflects Christ's light because of who he is and how he lives. And that's what we should all be striving to be. This great voice, John, crying out in the wilderness, he's not trying to make himself look great. He's trying to pave the way for Jesus, to make sure that we all know that Jesus is great. How do we reflect the light of Christ? to a darkened world? I think the answer is in our third Advent candle. It's love. Tertullian, who was one of the great early church defenders, when he was trying to explain to people who really hated on the early Christians, compared them to non-believers, to pagan folks, and, and said, they really are good people. They live good lives. See how they love each other. And this testimony of how those in the early church loved each other was indeed how the church grew so rapidly in a world that was often nasty, brutish, and short, with a government like Rome, which was oppressive, a community of people who loved each other, who cared for each other when they were sick, who shared their meager resources with people who had even less. That was something that people looked at and said, I want to be a part of that. The early church didn't grow because people were convinced of right dogma of Christianity or believed that everything in the Bible was factually true or even understood scriptures at all. They were attracted to the church of Jesus Christ because the people reflected Christ's love back to each other. It's something that would be good for us to remember. Sometimes churches act like we're in competition with the rest of the world to garner people's attentions. We have to have better programs for children than the sports teams do because then they'll come here for our really good programs. We've got to do everything we do programmatically super well, perfectly, and we've got to do a lot of it. One thing after another after another to prove to the world our worth. 
But that's not what we're called to do, not primarily. Primarily, we're called to love. And I do believe that just as in the first couple centuries when life was pretty brutal, we live in an age that's, uh, it's not first and second century ugly, but it's pretty nasty right now. And I think being a community that loves one another, that reflects that light of Christ, and that extends that love into our community, I think that's attractive to people right now, whether or not we have good programs or the best of anything else. I think we try and set up community stuff like this in our youth groups, at least I know in my youth group growing up that was true. The kids in middle school that I was around, they were nasty and mean. But the kids in my middle school youth group at church, they were nice to each other. Our leaders had set down some rules based on what it means to be Christian, and we were expected to treat one another in a different way than was expected at school. Adults, I don't know, I, I think sometimes when we move out of that youth group age where we're expected to live differently among each other, treat each other differently than the wider world, I think when we get to adults, we kind of stop doing that. The outside world rushes in. We have committees and programming and power struggles and competition for resources and attention all sorts of things that can make the love get buried somewhere down there. But we're called primarily to love. Reflect the light of Christ so that a world that's filled with hate can see the church of Jesus Christ as a powerful beacon of hope. And if we go then back to the Isaiah passage, always wondering why the lectionary people put these things together, you can also see that God's love and God's justice are intertwined. God loves not just us, but God loves them. God loves not just our kind of people, but the kind of people we don't like. And that knowledge, the, the power of God's love for all humanity stirs us to, to desire justice, to work for the good of all, even in situations where it doesn't benefit us personally. God's love and God's justice are intertwined. So as the Apostle Paul wrote, peace, hope, and love abide these three, but the greatest of these is love. Our hymn will be 160. To us, to all in sorrow and fear, him 
rejoice, rejoice, take heart in the night, the dark, the winter, and chill is. The rising sun shall crown you with light, be strong and loving and fearless. Love be our song and love our prayer, and love our endless story. May God fill every day. So for our, our prayer today, I am going to ask you to imagine two people. I mean, these are real people, but I want you to bring them to mind. The first, in your left hand, I want you to think of someone you love dearly who needs your prayer right now. Got it? And in your right hand, I want you to imagine that you are, are holding there someone that you don't like right now very much, but who you need to pray for, for your own good self, because you've been feeling frustrated or angry or bitter toward them. And so let us pray. We pray, O oh God, for this person we hold in our left hand. This beloved soul who is struggling right now and who is hurting O oh God, as our love washes over them, we ask that your love wash over them too. Help them to know that they are not alone in their struggle. That you are always with them. And that we are with them too. Help us, O oh God, to find ways to lighten their burden and keep a prayer for them in our heart all the day long. Let your healing helping presence make all that is troubling now turn toward good. And we pray for this person that we hold in our right hand. And we acknowledge that we don't feel very loving toward them, O oh God. But help us just a little bit to pray for them and their well being. O oh God, we know that Jesus told us to love our enemies and pray for those who persecute us. But sometimes it's hard. It may not be what they deserve, 
but it's who we want to be. Teach us to love just a little bit, just a little better. All this we pray in Jesus' name. He who reflected love in all that he did. He who is the one true light coming into this world. And we pray with the words that he taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Our final hymn is Once in David's Royal City. Now, beloved, go in grace, go in peace, go in love, for you cannot go where God is not. Amen. <laughs>